Glorious Father in heaven, honor and praise be unto thy name for all that you do for the sons of men. And Lord, as we learn, may our spirit be humble, that Lord, we may speak truth in a truthful way and in a honest way, having mercy and compassion to those who need it, and even for those who are undeserving, that Lord, we may be like thine character, that you bring rain upon the wicked and the righteous. And so help us to be holy as thou art holy. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, uh, praise the Lord and uh, welcome to uh, our second presentation in this series of uh, Minneapolis 1888. And uh, today I'm looking, or uh, in this presentation, I'm looking at um, the Ministerial Institute. The Ministerial Institute, they lead up to the 1888 itself, they lead up to 1888 itself. And uh, I just want us to speak of uh, some of the things that uh, transpired uh, as we look uh, at uh, what really this general conference was all about. And uh, I can't say that uh, I'll be able to share everything in the 1888 materials, but uh, I'm taking what uh, I have seen that it has impacted my life, my belief uh, system, and uh, how I approach things since I became a Seventh-day Adventist in 2009. And... Uh, uh, stumbled upon this material in uh, 2012, around uh, 2011-2012, and started studying it out to see what was this that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist had in 1888, how is it connected to salvation, how does it affect the church, and um, what did the Lord want to do through the, that session. And so I'm sharing basic information. My main uh, object, uh, object, objective is uh, that um, we may go back and uh, study it out and see what the Lord wanted to do to the church and be able to do those things. Because um, uh, as I read these materials, I found out that um, the Lord was willing to translate his church if it were ready, if it accepted the message of righteousness by faith. And then the delegates went out to share the message to the four corners of the world to ripen the harvest. But uh, seeing that um, the hearts were padlocked with prejudice, some accepted the message, some did not accept it. And most of the delegates were delegates were confused to what they should go and tell the congregation. And so the delegates that attended, being confused, they could not know what to tell the congregation. And uh, that impacted so much the reception of the message and it's spreading and it um, remained within the pressing gates of uh, the battle creek instead of going into the four corners of the world to ripen the harvest and so uh, much preliminaries won't do a lot i like to jump into the ministerial institute that lead up to uh, this uh, general conference in hebrews 10 38 39 we are in we read that now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of um, the soul. And the reason why I put this scripture on the wall or on the projection is that um, the Lord was willing that it is church may go forward in revival and reformation, that it may reach the full stature that will make the angel in Revelation chapter 14 say that put in the sickle because the vine of the earth is ripe, meaning that the church has reached the full stature and the measure of the man Jesus Christ, and it has come to the unity of faith a church without spot or wrinkle, a church ready to be the bride uh, of uh, the bridegroom. And so the just shall live by faith. Whatever was happening in that period, and we shall see that um, 
1888, there was um, um, there was an agitation of um, the Sunday laws. There was um, the, the 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 Blair Law, which was to pass the Sunday law observance, which was um, defended by A.T. Jones and overruled that it will not be passed. And this was in God's providence. So he wanted his church to go forward in the Reformation. He wanted it to be mature in the Reformation. But alas, that um, the church, instead of going forward, later on we find that it started to retreat back to Egypt, both in its Reformational lines, be it educational line, be it um, health reforms. Name all the reforms that the Lord wanted to bring to the church and had been bringing into the church, all went backward. And that is why he decries that he shall not be pleased by those who draw back, but the just shall live by faith, they shall go forward. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And uh, think about that uh, the message that was to be brought was the message of righteousness by faith. And that is why this text has to be insisted. These scriptures have to be insisted. But um, uh, uh, conspicuously, that um, uh, the, 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 the immediate verse says that uh, his heart in him, uh, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. So while they just had to live by faith, Actually, the condition of the church that uh, the heart was not right, it was uplifted and it was not the right thing, but the Lord wanted to do the right thing, but the people could not open their hearts, which were padlocked by prejudice. And so that uh, message did not go on as um, uh, it was intended to go. The questions to be asked then is, my exception in the final judgment will be based on a, by character, B, the character of which Christ has worked out, and C, we have um, what we may say, the forgiveness of sin. And these are the great issues in Minneapolis, 1888. The question was about character, how in the final judgment, uh, God will be able to uh, ascertain what um, should be able to get somebody unto the uh, um, unto the uh, gates of heaven. And so this was much important. And so the ministerial institute comes in the lead up to that um, very conference, which is something that um, all of us have to study. Now, uh, we always have general conference sessions, but uh, before the general conference sessions, we should be having ministerial institutes to uh, uh, flesh out our differences, to be able to have an upper room experience so that when these sessions matters of grave importance, how the church should move forward are to be discussed, there are no variances that will hinder the outpouring of the spirit amongst those people who are attending the general conference session. And this ministerial institute prior to the general conference is so much important that uh, it is not a time for war. It is a time to ex ex exhibit the Philadelphian love, that is the brotherly love, to show each other love, to discuss things in a, an atmosphere which is not um, a, 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 a charge, to, to show what it means to be together as a family. So that um, it is a time of knowing each other, knowing what is happening here and there, meeting up friends and all that, and discussing some doctrinal advances, advancement uh, among us. Then we have a general conference session to be able to chat a way forward for the church, to report in what is needed to be done here and what is needed to be done there in the whole world uh, as the delegates meet. But... Um, I don't know if that still happens, ministerial institute are there to discuss some things that should be discussed, if there's any doctrinal differences in the spirit of Christ. I don't see that both in the mainstream church, in, in the self-supporting churches and independent, self-supporting ministries and in the independent ministries. 
it is like that has been forgotten. The upper room experience to flesh out this uh, problem so that uh, the general conference may be a session where God can attend and be able to pour his spirit upon the agreements uh, that the church has to do. And so some of the things that uh, have to ha appeared in uh, in that session, my acceptance, the final judgment will be based on my character, the character of which Christ has worked out within me, the forgiveness of sin. And so let us continue and see. Seventh-day Adventist in the 1888 General Conference, uh, it is seen as a milestone in their history, a major turning point in their theological uh, development, and we shall see that. Um, in Minneapolis, 1888, the Ministerial Institute uh, was in October from 10th to 16th. Then the General Conference uh, followed from uh, 17th to November uh, 4. Adventists are still sharply divided over the meaning and the significance of the 1888 wow. meetings. And, uh, you know, uh, I say that um, it is so sad, very sad, that uh, such an important thing such, such an important history in the church can be um, something that is no, not known by many in the church. If you will go to, I, I won't say even an average, I'll just say if you go to Seventh-day Adventist and uh, the people that are um, really looked upon to uh, uh, be able to explain to the church the history of the church, the advancing of the message, and how the Lord has led us in the past history, and ask them, can you explain to me uh, the issues of um, 1888? Can you be able to um, uh, chronologically tell me what significance this message had upon the church? You will be surprised to find that um, amongst us, uh, the people cannot explain our own history and be able to give a roadmap or give um, uh, a compass and a chart of where we are coming from and where we are going. And so uh, we find that uh, in uh, people are still, uh, Adventists are still sharply divided over the meaning and uh, the significance of the 1888 meetings. Again, some regard Minneapolis as a major victory, and um, you will hear some among us say that, yes, Maybe this and this happened, but uh, immediately after that, the message was accepted. Now, the, the, the logic will be, if uh, the message was accepted, why are we still here? Because we understand if the message was accepted, then, then God will have taken his charge. So if immediately the message was accepted, then um, um, why are we still here? Logically, why are we still here? And uh, you will hear some answers that uh, people say that, uh, you know, the Lord is patient with uh, his people and he's waiting for others who are coming in, who are new to be able to accept this message. But I like to say this. The history of Adventism is the history of the ancient Israel journey through the wilderness. And I want you to remember one incident where actually the children of Israel um, went to spy the land of Canaan. By the way, they went without the permission of the Lord, but the Lord accepted because he condescended himself to the uh, level of the children of Israel because they were so small in faith and they couldn't just go to conquer the land without spying it. They went to spy without God telling them when they came out of it after spying again, they found out they cannot go and uh, uh, be able to possess that land. This was their own problem in making. God had not told them to go and spy the land, but they went. And so when they came back, they started saying that the land is full of giants. It eats the people they are in and all that stuff. And then the Lord told them, okay, if that is the case, don't go again to fight those people. Uh, uh, let me see what I will do with you. Let me lead you in another way because you think that uh, going there is uh, something so... Um, uh, 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 terrible for you and they were uh, of little faith this is the story of ancient Israel and it is the story of uh, the modern Adventists now when they came back the Lord told them don't go but the people again went 
to they, they, they took their weapons they took the they, they camp set on to go when the lord had said not go and when they went they were beaten very thoroughly now why do i bring this story here when they did this and they came back and tried to go by themselves they were defeated when adventists were told we are now ready to enter into the heavenly canon and they rejected the message after that you find that they are saying that they are accepted and we are still here just the way the children of israel now say that we accept to go but they then they spend again 40 days in the wilderness meaning that actually their acceptance was not based on faith but it was their own works they thought that now we can go and fight without the lord who has told us to go and fight and so they were defeated Adventists think that uh, after 1888, the message was accepted, but why are we still here? The same stubbornness that Israelites had in the wilderness, it is the one that is making us to be here. Instead of uh, 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 confessing their sins as Daniel confessed in Daniel chapter 9 and acknowledging that they had done wrongs and all that stuff, they had padlocked their hearts, now they try to do things on their own. And that is why we are still here in legalism, having theology which is right but without the spirit accompanying it and uh, we are stuck the way the Israelites were stuck in the wilderness in fact we shall read that uh, it was not the will of god that uh, the children of israel be in the wilderness for 40 years and that is the same thing it was not the will of god after the 1880 1844 and 1888 we should be here but um the same thing that happened to the ancient Israel is the same thing that has happened to modern Israel. So uh, some regard Minneapolis as a major victory. If it is a victory, then uh, it is a lie that uh, we are still here. Others view it as the denomination's greatest, tra uh, greatest tragedy. And um, of the opinion number two, that it is the denomination's greatest tragedy because uh, we are still here and we are stuck without even being able to uh, explain well what is Minneapolis and what it entails. But uh, you can go back to the introductory uh, uh, message and see the snippets of uh, what actually the Lord wanted to do. He wanted people to receive his righteousness and be able to be obedient to the law of God. Now, the landmark truths, uh, the landmark truth. Landmark truth, the sanctuary, the spirit of prophecy, the three angels' messages, conditional immortality, second advent, and law and Sabbath. These are the things that uh, uh, the Lord wanted to bring into prominence because uh, these things that you are seeing, they could have been, uh, if the people were well versed by them and uh, they were proclaimed uh, or on the face of the earth in the whole world, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the role of the spirit of prophets among us, the three angels' messages in totality, and the conditional immortality, and then the second advent, how near it was and how it relates to the law and Sabbath. Then if these messages were understood and spread, then the people could have been ready to face the Blair law that was in the parliament and be able to be triumphant but seeing that people were divided on the sanctuary they were divided on the role of the spirit of prophecy as we shall see because you find gi butler uh, really saying that if eg white can side with ej wagoner and et jones on the law of in galatians then we cannot believe that she is being inspired by the lord anymore and then you have a people amongst us who bellinger had uh, infected the doubts on the sanctuary message and they were still not uh, understanding the sanctuary messages well. And even today, people don't understand the sanctuary message well. We have uh, those who believe that uh, the atonement was uh, 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 finished at the cross. Even among us, the Seventh-day Adventists, I'm not talking about the Sunday keepers. If you ask some Adventists, they will tell you that uh, the atonement was finished on the sanctuary. How is that so? They say that... Uh, uh, you know, when Christ uh, died and ascended in heaven, he went into the most holy place instead of the holy of holies. And so it destroys the structure of the sanctuary completely. And then it does away with what we call the dual atonement. The dual atonement, this is where the lamb is sacrificed. And after the lamb is sacrificed, the blood is applied uh, on the day of atonement. And then uh, the sanctuary is cleansed. And then uh, 
we have the second advent, how Christ will appear and uh, how near he was. And the conditional immortality, which actually it is at the heart of uh, spiritualism. Are the dead dead or are they not dead? What is the, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the issues to deal with sin? And uh, how do, what do we inherit from Adam? And what kind of nature did Christ have and all that stuff? And then this whole package, a system of truth, then the law and the Sabbath, how are they related? How do we proclaim the Sabbath more fully? And uh, she goes ahead to explain Isaiah 58 being the third angel's message to Seventh-day Adventists. There is the third angel's message to the Seventh-day Adventists, and there is the third angel's message to the whole world. The third angel's message to the world is to warn them against receiving the mark of the beast by uh, 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 accept, accepting Sunday sacredness. The third angel's message to Seventh-day Adventists, which is to proclaim the, message, the Sabbath message fully, is in Isaiah chapter 58, medical missionary work, which is the right arm of the third angel's message that goes to the world. And this is something, this is a system of truth that had to mature the church and then uh, make the church ready for the uh, second advent of Jesus Christ. So... The man, Alonzo Trevor Jones, uh, born in 1850 and uh, uh, died in 1923. Uh, the man himself, reading in, uh, uh, reading in Washington, D.C., Review and Herald, uh, 1962, uh, that is uh, pages 291 and uh, 292. This is what we read of this man as recorded. And uh, uh, this is reported by Arthur W. Spalding, Origin and History of Seventh-day Adventist Volume uh, uh, in, in, his, in his four volumes. Jonas was a towering angular man with the loping gait and uncouth posturings and gestures. He was aggressive and at times obstreperous and he gave just cause for resentment. And so one of the reasons that um, you hear people did not accept the message is because they looked at the character of H. Jonas and E.J. Wagoner and said that if these are the men that we are being told that the Lord is working through them to bring the church the message that is to mature the church, then we can believe this can be of the Lord. Now, in one of the letters, EGY says that um, some rejected the message because of the messengers, but um, we should not be in the habit of ignoring the messages of God because of the messengers. Yes, we understand that the messengers are um, very important when it comes to the delivering of the message. But then this was not the reason. Because God was testing his people to see if they thought the message more important, that they took the message more important than the one who was bearing it. The Lord will test people in every kind of way to see if they are mature in their walk with him. And so uh, there is a way that uh, Etijones was not uh, pleasing to the people, bearing also in mind that these two people were young men and we had older men in Seventh-day Adventists. And so their behavior and we don't know exactly what was their behavior. We just read of what they said it was their behavior, but we can get some clues. As we shall be continuing, we'll see that uh, some way or another that uh, they, th this old guards thought that uh, uh, Jonas was not so respectful to the older guards in Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, Jonas and Wagner were not pioneers of Seventh-day Adventists. That one should come up so clear. They are later people who are just the messengers of justification by faith. So he, he was not respectful to these people. In um, uh, another time that he was rebuked by E.G. E. Uh, White herself, and uh, she was warned of her messages on extremity, on uh, sanctification, and all this. So they, they looked more on men than they looked on the message itself. And uh, the real problem of 1888 was a man looking unto man instead of looking at Jesus Christ. If they had focused on the message rather than the man, it could have been so different today. And so uh, this is the report about uh, Jonas. And uh, you see how he is painted negatively. I don't want to say that he was bad because I was not there, but uh, it seems that uh, he was painted negatively. And so uh, Elder A.T. Jonas, dear brother, 
this is Sister White now speaking to Eti Jones. I attended a meeting of the conference after you spoke yesterday, and I could not roll off the burden which came upon me. The way in which you spoke did not leave the best impression upon the people. That night I was greatly burdened, and one of authority said to me, Say to my servant, Alonzo Jones, that he is to stand as a representative man. He is to put on Christ Jesus and is to be guarded in his attitude and words. Now, let us backtrack. Jonas was a touring angular man with a loping gait and uncouth posturing and uh, uncouth posturings and gestures. He was aggressive. Look at that word. He was aggressive and at times obstreperous and he gave just cause for uh, resentment. He did not bear with men. And so E.G. White is warning him. And you see how the angel approaches Jonas or delivers the message to the Jonas. He says, tell my servant. Look, look, look at that voice. Look at that tone. And he says um, that um, that night I was greatly burdened and one of authority said to me, say to my servant. So heaven considers this man who people were seeing he was not right. I'm not justifying him that he was still the servant of God. You know where God has taken us from. And there are still some elements of uh, 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 worldly attitudes and characters and some arising of flesh in us as we deliver our messages. And God forbid that this can be traced in us today. May God give us a heart of repentance and a heart of having the character of Christ. I know how I have fallen short of that. Say to my servant Alonzo Trevor Jones that he is to stand as a representative man. He is to put on Christ Jesus. Uh, bearing in mind that he was carrying the message of justification by faith, which was the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the angel appeals to him, put on Jesus Christ, and is to be guarded in his attitude and words, so that he shall not give others an excuse for being dicta di dictatorial and overbearing, as Arthur, uh, uh, as Arthur uh, W. Spalding reports, reports. The spirit of what? Harshness? of a desire to rule must be put away from our ministers, our teachers, and the managers of our institutions. The meekness of Christ must be revealed. And it seems that, um, it seems that um, Alonzo Trevor Jones was missing these things. You have naturally a dictatorial spirit, and it has increased in your efforts to eradicate the evils which have come in since the Minneapolis meeting. Your great strength and power lies in linking up with Jesus Christ. John, Corliss, and yourself are men through whom God can work if you will let the knowledge of the truth be a burning and a shining light. However wrong the cause of others, let no thrust be made. Now, look at what uh, Spalding says in the previous paragraph that uh, he gave just cause for resentment. Because Alonso Trevor Jones was not treated well with other brethren, he resented them in every way. And E.G. White says that uh, let no threats be made, uh, however wrong the course of others, the way they look at you. Don't resent them. Don't repay evil with evil. You are bearing a message which has divine credential. Let no threats be made. No yokes laid upon the neck of anyone. You are to break every yoke. God calls upon you to be tender hearted pitiful and courteous in presenting the blessed invitations of the gospel. Let every word be that which under similar circumstances will be spoken by the Savior. And so we have a picture of Alonzo Trevor Jones and why men refused the message because they were looking at the man instead of the message itself. It is essential for you to soften and subdue your manner of address, else you will do harm. Do not exhibit your natural traits of character, but be clothed with humility. You have most powerful truth to present, and it will exert its influence if your life testifies to your close relation to Christ. Now, let us pause for a second here. The reason why this message has not gone, whichever message that we have, if you're talking to people about health reform, if you're talking to people about dress reform, if you're talking about uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary, one true God, name any doctrine that you have. If this is not accompanied by the Spirit of Christ, 
50% of your message is eroded. And then you are left with the 50% there. And there is some hardness in the message you are presenting. You may be losing another 20%. So here you have another 30%. And then you may have be having a people who just uh, uh, are not up to the standard of, of what you are speaking about. And then you lose another 20. You have 10% of success of what you are presenting just because of some personal traits that you may be having amongst the people. And so let us be careful that uh, in uh, our invitation of the people to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is victory over sin, that um, there will be no message of trusts. Let us learn how to present the message in a way, I'll not use the word appealing, but in a way that Christ will use it and then reach unto the hearts of men before you do anything else. Be sure that uh, the hearts of men are softened and subdued. Don't create more stony hearts. You will lose the importance of the message. Make the hearts of flesh first and then be able to present the message, however hard it may be. When the hearts are softened, then it is uh, 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 surely uh, easier to be received. And so here is um, uh, an advice to Alonzo Trevor Jones. There is no use of putting harshness into the voice. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such a things. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. I feel myself so condemned before God that I repented, and in contrition of spirit, ask him to forgive me for every word I have spoken, which, though truth, it would have been better not to speak. And so, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones, uh, actually in quote speaking back to the prophet and uh, he acknowledges that uh, he may have spoken once in the way that they should have not been spoken. Continued on, <clears throat> we have every evidence that the Lord is using Elder Jones, Elder Wagoner, and Professor Prescott. And with this evidence before us, it pains my heart that any of my brothers in the faith should feel impatient and bitter toward them and refuse to draw in courts of love and unity with them. Strife must cease. We must have unity. These representatives, these representative men must respect one another and work in harmony. You have a most responsible position and the Lord will greatly bless you if you walk in humility before him. But do not, my brother, expect every mind to be constituted like your own. Do not expect that your brethren will see everything in the same light and attach the same importance to some matters that you do, for you will certainly be disappointed. And uh, I have to thank the Lord that there was a prophetess among us, because she also had some differences with Wagona, with some teachings that Wagona had. But if you see how E.G. White embraced Wagona and tried to guide him through all the sessions of Minneapolis and to counsel with him, you will never know that E.G. White had some different doctrinal differences from, uh, 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 from uh, he had some uh, doctrinal differences with uh, E.G. White. Uh, I don't know if I, I can just uh, be able to get this um, uh, so quickly that um, even if um, we differ in the way that uh, we do things, we should be careful with uh, how we differ with the people. I, I like to put this on the screen just for the sake that people may say, and where did you get this idea that um, E.G. White had some doctrinal difference with the uh, Wagona. This is uh, in um, MS 15, 18, 18, 8. Uh, I'll go back to this screen and uh, bear with me. Look at what um, first she says before I go to the other one. She says <clears throat> that um, strife 
must cease, we must have unity. These representative men must respect one another and work in harmony. You have a most responsible position and the Lord will greatly bless you if you walk in humility before him. But do not, my brother, expect every man to be constituted like your own. Do not expect that your brethren will see everything in the same light. E.G. White herself never saw things the way Wagona saw them in some doctrinal teachings. And this is what I wanted to put across. But if you see the spirit in which she handled E.J. Wagona, you will never know that uh, she had some differences with, uh, with Wagona. Some teachings of Wagona, E.G. White could not agree with. 1888 controversy then and now. Of one thing I'm certain, as Christians, you have no right to entertain feelings of enmity. Uh, look here. Uh, unkindness and prejudice toward Wagona who has presented his views in plain, straightforward manner as a Christian should. If he is in error, you should, in a calm, rational, Christ-like manner, seek to show him from the word of God where he is out of harmony with its teachings. If you cannot do this, hold your peace. You have no right as Christians to pick flaws, to criticize, to work in the dark, to prejudice minds with your objection. This is Satan's way of working. Now look, at, look here. Some interpretation of scripture given by Dr. Wagoner, I do not regard as correct, but I believe him to be perfectly honest in his views, and I will respect his feelings and treat him as a Christian gentleman. I have no reason to think that he is not as much esteemed of God as are any of my brethren, and I shall regard him as a Christian brother, so long as there is no evidence that he is unworthy. The fact that he honestly holds some views of scripture differing from yours or mine is no reason why we should treat him as an offender or as a dangerous man and make him the subject of unjust criticism. We should not raise a voice of censure against him or his teachings unless we can present weighty reasons for so doing and show him that he is in error. No one should feel at liberty to give loose rein to the compatible spirit. Very, very, very amazing, unlike what we do today. Today, I'll differ with a brother. Tomorrow, I have blocked him. The next day, I don't want to hear about him. The third day, I have to spread on social media that that brother is a heretic. This is the spirit of 1888, and it has never been uprooted among us. But you see how E.G. White herself is dealing with Wagona. She is having a problem with how Wagona is interpreting some parts of the scripture, but you don't see her showing that. She is trying to make sure that she is giving this person a humble time to present what he is presenting. Pick what is right and what is wrong, leave it or correct her, and pray the Lord that, we will, that he will show Wagona, what he is wrong on. But the people that attended the ministerial institute, they took that session to hate Wagona and at Jonas Moore. Coming to Brother Prescott, also you will uh, read more about him, how he had his differences with the uh, washburn. And um, they created an, uh, I can't say enmity, but uh, they withdrew from each other and uh, if you read the letters between uh, Washburn and Prescott, you will find that there is no, uh, 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 there, there is blood, blood, a uh, brewing between them. Nothing good is going on. They have resentment for each other. So, 1888 had it is major uh, 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 blow in, in the brethren who are attending because they were there as Seventh Day Adventists. They were not there as a family. And that was a big, big, big issue there. If we gather together in a ministerial institute as a family, we will be able to have a breakthrough. But if we gather as Seventh-day Adventists, we won't be able to have a big breakthrough. Because as Seventh-day Adventists, what has become of us is a compatible spirit and be able not to pick that which is good from a brother, but to listen very keenly to if he will have an error instead of listening keenly if he will have something that will impact your life and be able to move you next to the next level of your faith. We attend sessions 
and we call each other brethren, sisters, but we are looking to that point where he will, we will be able to mark at minute so and so, this brother made this grievous error and I can't believe anything else he's going to speak if he can make such a mistake. Don't think that these things are there today. They started long time ago and it is the spirit that hindered the message of righteousness by faith going forward. Continued on, uh, Sister White talking to these brethren uh, because they were the messengers of, uh, of the messages of righteousness by faith, that they should be careful and uh, they should not expect everyone to accept what they are saying. Continued on, Elder John is walk carefully before God. You are a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. Be careful not to present in the paper views which you know will clash with Elder Smith. So here is a young man facing an old man. And E.G. White is cautioning this young man, although he has a message, be careful how you are dealing with Elder Smith because he is an old man. He has been a pioneer. And even though what you may say is truth, be careful how you put it out because it will just show that you are countering him. We shall see where actually we are going put to put forth a paper and then Elder Smith didn't comment about it and tomorrow he put another, uh, 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 another thing in the paper which was so contrary with what Wagona had put forth and he had not talked to Wagona. And E.G. White was told Smith, you should have never done that. If that if that is how the way how you work, then you could have just told Wagona, I'm not going to put your paper in the, I'm not going to put your article in the paper because of this and this. Instead of him putting forth an article and you come with something so contrary to what he had written. So be careful not to present in the paper views which you know will clash with Elder Smith, for he feels that he is in authority to control the articles which appear in the review. But if he makes an attempt to close the door that light shall not come to the people, then, sad as it may be, the Lord will remove him. But the Lord loves Brother Smith, and be careful that no occasion shall be given by publishing articles that he has not seen. If after he sees the articles and publishes them without seeing and speaking with the author of the article, then he has no right to put it in the paper and opposite view, for he hurts the cause of God. This is no time for dissension, Praise together, seek to be a unit. There should be a breaking down of ice reserve and a mutual confidence and freedom exercise. Each must guard his words. Avoid all impressions which savor of extremes. For those who are watching for a chance will seize hold of any words strongly expressed to justify them in their feelings of calling you an extremist. And so, you know what has happened with the message of one true God? The brethren see that what you are presenting is right, but because they don't believe like you do. And other messages, they will just look for that word which is not right in your article or in your presentation. And then they'll capture it, they'll screenshot it, and then put on the wall and say, this man said this and this. Do you think that this is a man that you can respect that he has the truth? And so Jonas is being cautioned. And I like how E.G. White is moving with everything. He doesn't go first to the opposers of the truth to tell them, you are on the wrong and get out of the way. No, that is not what that is not how she approaches the matter. She goes to the people who have the truth. And today, instead of us going to the people who are on the wrong, we should go to the people who are bearing the truth and tell them, brother, be careful what you are doing, because this may just hinder the truth that you are bringing forth. Be careful in your words. Be careful in this and this. Make sure that you are closer to God. But we don't speak to each other, the people who are in quotes bearing the truth. Rather, we have so much time to go to the opposers of the truth and start showing them this and this instead of uh, 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 appealing to our brethren who are our friends and tell them, be careful, the, the, the road that you are leading in is not the right road. See how E.G. White moves with the messengers of the truth and let us examine ourselves if that is the way we move with the people who have the truth today. Uh, and uh, I think the Lord will bless us. And so uh, she tells them that this is not the, not the time to be careless with these things. To elders M and H. Miller, God has sent you a message which he wishes you to receive, a message of light and hope and comfort for the people of God. 
it is not for you to choose the channel through which the light shall come. Now, these are the men that were against Jonas. These were the men that were against Wagona. These were the men that were against Prescott. And you understand that Prescott was a professor. And so, uh, when you look at the messages of Prescott, he spoke in finality. And uh, I have had many times brethren uh, uh, approach even me or uh, 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 approach somebody and tell them, brother, don't think that uh, what you are presenting is final. Leave room at least for the people to, uh, to see how they can uh, be able to come to the truth instead of presenting it in that finality. I mean that... Uh, Sometimes you present the truth and it comes out as if either you receive it or you don't receive it. Either you accept it or reject it. And uh, the, the line is drawn. What I have presented is the truth. And if you don't accept it, then know that you are headed to road to perdition. And so such like uh, things that can be read from our presentation, either you accept this and if you don't accept it, then you are not getting to heaven. We sometimes present things in finality in a way that uh, it instead of uh, inviting people to go back to their Bibles and spirit of prophecy and historical data to check out things, uh, they say that, uh, oh, this one has reached, this one knows everything. That is how he puts himself. And so why should I associate with someone who thinks that I don't know anything and he knows everything? This is like presenting things in finality. And this was the manner in which uh, actually Prescott sometimes had things. Uh, when you go to the discussion on the daily, where he had to present things on the daily, and then with uh, uh, A.G. Daniels, and uh, E.G. White told uh, Daniel and uh, Prescott that uh, you, you, you stop what you are doing with the, the issue on daily. Go to the cities and do a work that should be done for this time. And then when things have cooled down, you will be able to come and discuss with your brethren these things because they were presenting that either it be accepted what they were saying or nothing else. And E.G. White rebuked them and told them, we have a work to work in the cities. Go do that work. And at the right time, you can come and discuss such a thing. And by the way, when it was the right time, <clears throat> she called Prescott and Daniel and told them that, uh, I will now desire that uh, this matter may be settled. Why don't you call your brethren and discuss this issue about the daily? And uh, that is documented when uh, you read the notes on Daniel 8, uh, you will find such a, such a things. But I won't go there. We are in this ministerial institute of 1888. So Elders M and H. Miller had a problem with Wagner. They had a problem with Jonas. And they had a, a problem with Prescott, how they were presenting these things. The Lord desires to heal the wounds of his sheep and lambs through the heavenly balm of the truth that Christ is our righteousness. May God forbid that it shall be said of you, the deceased have yet not strength, have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. And why? Because you have a problem with the messengers. To Elder Essen Haskell, you will wonder why she is now writing to Elder Essen Haskell. But let us read on. Some will ask why it is that these messengers who fed us with the bread from heaven should make a mistake. Very interesting that E.G. White with her prophetic eye was able to see that uh, Wagona and Jonas could make a mistake. And so she saw people who were asking if these are the messengers how is it that they can make a mistake? I will ask you the same question. How is it that Nathan can make a mistake? How is it that David can make a mistake? How is it that the prophet of the Lord could make a mistake and be lied to by the old prophet? Answer that question, and then you can be able to answer why Wagona and Jonas can make a mistake. Men are fallible. It doesn't mean that when God has given you a message, you are infallible. So, and this is still, you can feel the atmosphere of Minneapolis that men were looking at men. They were not looking at Christ. And so they were, if you look at men, today, if somebody will present something, and then tomorrow I found this person has been involved in this and this, I will say, I'll throw out the man and the message itself, throwing out the, 
uh, uh, the, 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 the baby with the, 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 the bath towel or the water. Uh, I don't know the phrase in its exactness. But this is what men do. They present a good message and tomorrow they are overcome by sin and the people just do away with everything this man had. But some will ask, why is it that these messengers who fed us with the bread from heaven should make a mistake? They will say, why did we accept some things that we needed? And why did we accept other things that we should have let alone? Why was not the danger signal lifted? There has been danger for years. Men who have been chosen of God to do a special work have been imperiled because the people have looked to the men in the place of looking to God. When Elder Butler was president of the General Conference, ministers placed Elder Butler and Elder Smith and some others where God alone should be. And the same mistake was being committed. Men were placing Jonas, Wagoner, and Prescott where God should be, looking at the men and thinking that because these men are having the message from God, they should look just like God looks like. And I say that in quotes. Yes, we should like look like God looks like in character wise. But then uh, you don't have to pickle in the eyes of the people because here and there, there are some traits which God has not dealt with. Butler and Ella Smith had these traits also. The brethren made grave mistakes and the Lord sent messages of truth to correct their errors and to lead them into safe paths. But in spite of the reproof that have been given to the people, they still make men their trust and exalt and glorify the human agent. And this grave error is repeated again and again. The Lord has chosen men to bear light and messages of great importance to the people in these last days. After years of perseverance and under difficulties, the Lord has given marked success to it is truth. And the law here and the law there have arisen on every side and yet the message has sounded on. Every inch of the ground had to be fought in presenting the present message, and some have not been reconciled with the providence of God in selecting the very men who he did select to bear this special message. They ask why it is that he has not chosen the men who have been long in the work. The reason is that he knew that these men who had, who had had long experience would not do the work in God's way and after God's order. God has chosen the very men he wanted, and we have reason to thank him that these men have carried forward the work with faithfulness and have been the mouthpiece for God. Now, because they have not seen all things distinctly, because they were in danger, the Lord sent them a warning and let every soul who loves God thank the Lord for his mercies. What? Shall we thank God that these men were going too fast and were endorsing production that were not of heavenly origin? No. But thank the Lord that they did not resist the message of warning that the Lord saw fit to give them. And thus they did not repeat the grave error that some have made for years in resisting the spirit of God. Thank God they did hear his voice and at once obeyed it. In this matter, the churches have the greatest evidence that these men are chosen of the Lord. He has given them a message and has wrote through them, for they knew the voice of counsel from heaven and have obeyed it. The voice of warning of counsel of instruction has appealed to men who have been instructed with sacred duties and who bear weighty responsibilities in the review and herald office. And yet, though God has warned them early and late to do certain things and to leave certain things undone, all have not heard the voice or listened to the words of instruction. Did the men who have thus been warned step quickly into the path that was marked out for them as these two brethren have done? No. They did not. They chose to follow in their own selfish human counsel and have led others into false path. Some who have been warned have imperiled their souls. Some will never more see the way because darkness has come upon them and they have virtual, virtually said, we went not thy way, O God, we went out our own way. Now had the men who had been instructed with God's word walked with fearfulness and trembling before him and not in the imagination of their own hearts, God would have been glorified and souls would have been saved unto eternal life. Let them now engage in close searching of heart. Let them examine themselves as with a lighted candle, for the perils of the last days are upon us. Let not those who have neglected to receive light and truth take advantage of the mistake of their brethren, that is Wagona, um, Prescott, and Jonas, 
and put forth their finger and speak words of vanity because the chosen of God have been too ardent in their ideas and have carried certain matters in too strong a manner. We have need of these added elements for our work is not a passive work, our work is aggressive work. Had these men of experience who have failed to do their part, stood in the path of God's choosing and followed not the counsel of men but the counsel of God, they would have connected with the men who were chosen to give the message which the people needed in these last days. God will have worked through them and the work will have advanced much more rapidly and solidly than it has done. They could have done a most precious work if they had not cherished a spirit that was not pleasing to God and that closed their hearts to the working of the Holy Spirit. They entered into temptation and did not yield to evidence but began to question, to find fault and to oppose. This was their attitude and because of their unbelief, God could not use them to his name's glory. They grieved the spirit of God time and time again. Had they walked in obedience to the light, send them from heaven, their experience in the rise and advancement of the third angel's message would have been of great value in helping to make complete the work for this time. But they refused to fill the position for which they were fitted and failed to do the work for which God had qualified them. And they stood as criticizers and thought they could design many flaws in the men whom God was using. The chosen agents of God would have been rejoiced to link up with the men who had aloof from them, questioning, criticizing, and opposing. If the union had existed between these brethren, which Christ in his lessons has enjoined upon his disciples, some mistakes, some mistakes and errors which have occurred will have been avoided. And uh, love covers a multitude of sin. If these people had walked with Jonas and Wagoner, some of these things that had happened afterwards, they could have not happened. And there are things which happened in 1892 um, and uh, towards 1902, which could have never happened. And uh, maybe you can revisit the story of uh, uh, the Holy Flesh movement, which actually uh, uh, Wagner and Jonas uh, came to uh, 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 affiliate with. And then... Um, I mean, uh, it's Jonas, and then uh, you have a spiritual affinity, which uh, Wagona later got involved in. If these brethren were so close with Wagona and Jonas, this issue of uh, Holy Flesh movement and spiritual affinity could have not happened with these two brethren. But um, when they saw the message was rejected, they also didn't feel the atmosphere was right to them and they walked their own way and they got snared and snared in some other things so in 1888 1244 as we read the history this is how he con she concludes to elder sn haskell but if the men who should have used their experience in furthering the work have labored to hinder it and mistakes have occurred that will not have occurred if they had stood in their allotted place whom will god hold men accountable for these late errors who will god hold accountable for these late errors he will hold the very men accountable who should have been gathering light and united with the faithful watchmen in these days of period but where were they they were holding themselves in the position of those who were non-receivers of the light for themselves and intercepting the light that god would send to others they place themselves between god and the light and they have lost the precious light and peace which they did have and have lost the most precious drought from the fountain of light and life they have placed themselves where lands could not be placed upon them as upon god's chosen men of opportunity let us go to the bible and see what it says on this uh, issue uh, this the spirit of the pharisees Um, let us see this in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Matthew chapter 23, from verse 13. This is uh, what um, we get from the, the Bible. Matthew 23, around verse 13. But who unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourself, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. 
what did Iji White tell these men? She tells them that uh, they were holding themselves in the position of those who are non-receivers of the light for themselves and intercepting the light that God will send to others. They placed themselves between God and the light and they have lost the precious light. They were not entering and they were not allowing people to enter. That was the spirit of the Pharisees. To Uriah Smith in September 1992, this is what she recalls and tells uh, Uriah Smith. It is quite possible that Elder John is or Elder Wagner may be overthrown by the temptation of the enemy. But if they should be, this will not prove that they had heard no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. But should this happen, how many will take this position and enter into a fatal delusion? Because they are not under the control of the Spirit of God. They walk in the sparks of their own kindling and cannot distinguish between the fire they have kindled and the light which God has given. And they walk in blindness as did the Jewish. And so people are looking at these brethren and pointing at the mistakes of Jonas and Wagner. And some of these loopholes were there. And Sister White reminded them, you have been so used to looking at men and that is what you will be doing till Christ comes. You are looking unto men instead of looking at the message. And it is possible that Wagner and Jonas could be overthrown. But don't make this delusion that they didn't have a message because you will point at those mistakes and say, see, these are the people whom you say that they had a message. How can they do such a things? And then enter into this delusion. It was not from God when it was from God and it could have made the church ripe and be harvested by Christ. In the week-long ministerial institute that preceded the general conference, two issues divided the ministerial workforce. And uh, let us look at this as we bring to an end. A conflict over the ten horns in Daniel 7. Uriah Smith in the Review in Herald and in his book on Daniel and Revelation claimed that the ten horns were the hands. I want you to notice what is happening here in ministerial institute. And Eti Jones in the science article stated that the ten horns were the Alemanni. So here you have Daniel and the Revelation having the ten horns at the hands and A.T. Jones, whom actually in the later work we are told that he was on the truth, he held that the tenth horn was Aleman. Now, A.T. Robinson in 1931, uh, talking about Jones' disrespectful language, he says this in, uh, 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 in his book, uh, page 336. Elder Uriah Smith and Eti Jones were discussing some features in connection with the ten kingdoms into which Western Rome was divided. This is the ministerial institute leading up the general conference. And you know that uh, Jones has a resentment for Uriah Smith and Uriah Smith has a resentment for Eti Jones and Wagner. And so this is a back and forth battle between these two stalwarts of uh, 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 Adventism. And so one day Elder Smith in his characteristic modesty and uh, by the way, uh -huh. you have to learn about Elder Uriah Smith, by the way. This man, E.G. White, says that uh, he was a very cool person. He, he was not as talkative as I am. He was not rude uh, and he was not uncouth and he was not high voiced uh, like uh, uh, some of us and as I am. Uh, in one of the places he writes about Uriah Smith that... Um, Ella James could, and E.G. White could go someplace and uh, give a very distinct message in uh, a way that uh, it was so heavy to the people. And then here comes uh, Elder, Elder Uriah Smith and like put some more on that message. He, he tells the people, don't worry, and such like things. And not exactly the word, but he tries to cool the things down and says that here is the cool one. Uriah Smith enters into, into the place and uh, tries to calm the people down. He was a man who was cool. And so this is not just about Robinson speaking. I have a quote where E.G. White talks about Elder Smith being a very cool man. And so she says that he says that uh, Elder Uriah Smith, uh, Elder Smith, in his characteristic modesty, stated that he did not claim originality in the view he held on the subject, that he had taken statements such as men as uh, Clark, that is uh, uh, Adam Clark and uh, Barnes and Scott and others mentioned and drawn his conclusion from such authorities. The way today I'll just be doing some research 
And I go pick up a statement from a brother which I trust and another brother which I trust and I put together an article and I submit it to uh, another brother or I present it. And because we have issues with brethren, he uh, they rebut it and, uh, in a, a very awkward way. And so here is um, Elder Smith later told the people, you know, what I have presented did not original, uh, originate from me, but I took it from Clark, Barnes, and Scott and thought that this was a weightier matter. This was a weightier evidence of, uh, of uh, the tense horn being the hands. I took from this man this information. Now, let us proceed with the story. Um, and drawn his conclusion for such authorities. In opening his reply, Elder Jones, in his characteristic style, began by saying, you remember what E.G. White talk, talk, talked about, uh, Jones, that uh, his language was not as good. So Robinson says that Elder Jones, in his characteristic style, began by saying, Elder Smith has told you he did not know anything about this matter. I do, and I don't want you to blame me for what he does not know. Think about that for a moment. Here you are a young man, you are addressing an old man, and this is the language you open your defense with. You, you see the problem we are having now. This harsh statement called forth an open rebuke from Sister White, who was present in the meeting, and we have read about this. So, there was another story. The second issue was the conflict over the law in Galatians. In Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, the pedagogist, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, uh, a schoolmaster. Uh, and uh, O.A. Johnson, the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law, the two laws in review and Herald 1886. And here, Wagoner says, in a series of nine articles in the science in which he claimed that the law in Galatians is the moral law. Now, as the story unfolds, we shall find that uh, this law in Galatians was not the real thing, but the, the issue was about justification by faith. And so here are the two people clashing, and uh, they are standing on the law being the ceremonial, and uh, Iwagona is standing on the law being the moral law. Conflict between the prophetess and George I.D. Butler. E.G. White, then, shortly after the appearance of Butler's article, Ellen White told Butler that she had not sent him a copy of her letter to Wagon and Jones to use as a weapon against them, but that he and Smith, uh, he and Smith who published the article should follow the same caution in bringing disagreements to the public attention. Resolved. Now, this is the ministerial institute, and then they are heading to the general conference, and then they are having wars, but this is the resolution written on the board. Resolve the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law signed by J.H. H. Morrison, Iowa Conference President. Remember, at this time, now G.I. Butler is at home sick. And why is he sick? Because the things that Wagner and Jonas are saying, he cannot wrap them around his mind. And so he is a sick man at home. You can read the letters E.G. White writes to G.I. Butler about his sickness and why he is at home. But while he is at home, he is sending telegrams stand by the old landmarks. Later on, you'll find in Council to Workers, E.G. White saying that, uh, here is G.I. Butler saying that stand by the long, old landmarks. But these are the landmarks, and this noise about all landmarks is nothing. He, she cannot remember the law in Galatians and all this stuff being a landmark. So it was signed. The law in Galatians is ceremonial by the people who are opposing J Wagner and uh, Jones, but then they, they left a place for Wagner and Jones to sign that the law in Galatians is the moral law, and these two brethren never signed that thing. They, they saw that this was not the spirit of God. This is not the way things should be done, and they were just headed to a general conference. E.G. White, conflicting with them, says in the scripture in Galatians 3.24, the Holy Spirit through the ap apostle is speaking especially of the moral law. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee to him for pardon and peace. 1, 1 SM 2.34. To Mary White, Elder Olsen is to be president of the general conference and Brother Dan Jones of Kansas is to help him. Elder Haskell will serve until Brother Olsen shall come from Europe. I cannot tell what the future may reveal, but we shall remain for about four weeks in Battle Creek and get out a testimony that should come 
out just now without delay. Then we can see how matters move at the great end of the work. We are determined to do all we can in the fear of God to help our people in this emergency. So 1888 was called an emergency. Why was it an emergency? We shall see that the Blair law was in the parliament. God was wanting to make his people ready, but there are people who are standing on the way. Look at what she says about Butler. A sick man's mind has had a controlling power over the General Conference Committee, and the ministers have been the shadow and echo of Elder Butler about as long as it is healthy and for the good of the cause. Envy, evil surmisings, jealousies have been working like living until the whole land seemed to be living. Elder Butler, we think, has been in office three years too long, and now all humility and loneliness of mind have departed from him. He thinks his position gives him such a power that his voice is infallible. To get this off from the minds of our brethren has been a difficult matter. His, uh, his case will be difficult to handle, but we trust in God. I have not had a very easy uh, writing to Brother Haley. I have not had a very easy time since I left the Pacific Coast. Our first meeting was not like any other general conference I ever attended. The thought that some of our brethren ventured to entertain some ideas contrary to those of the leading brethren filled the minds of some of our brethren with just prejudice that they could not, with any fairness, even come to an investigation of the position of our faith with anything like Christian feelings. It was more after the order developed by the priests and rulers and Pharisees in the days of Christ. Because I came from the Pacific coast, they would have it that I had been influenced by Willie White, Dr. Wagoner, and Etty Jones. Brother Butler wrote me a letter of a most singular purport and made wonderfully strong statements in it. He called these men whom God has appointed to do a special work in his cause, fledglings. He moreover said that he had received letters from Northern and Central California saying that they will not send their children to the college if the views of E.J. Wagoner and E.T. Jones were brought in. This is a blatant rejection of the message of 1888 by the president of the General Conference. Well, I'll not attempt to tell you all about this matter, but I learned that you are one who wrote letters of warning to Elder Butler. I asked him if I might see the letter, but he said that he had destroyed it. Strange proceedings. My brother, is the Lord leading you? or is the enemy working upon your mind as upon the minds of others? I have come to the conclusion that this is the case. I have not changed my views in reference to the law in Galatians, but I hope that I shall never be left to entertain the spirit that was brought into the general conference. I have not the least hesitancy in saying it was not the spirit of God. If every idea we have entertained in doctrines is truth, will not the truth bear to be investigated? Will it totter and fall if it if criticized? If so, let it fall. The sooner, the better. The spirit that would close the door to investigation of points of truth in a Christ-like manner is not the spirit from above. To R.A. Underwood, who also had an opposition of this message, I did not desire to definitely state this particulars in the conference for the delegates to grapple and misconstrue. But I said enough in regard to what the Lord had, put, had been pleased to show me. I stated that I was a stockholder and I could not let the resolution pass that there was to be special light for God's people as they neared the closing scenes of this earth history. Another angel was to come from heaven with a message and the whole world earth was to be lighted with its glory. It will be impossible for us to state just how this additional light will come. It might come in a very unexpected manner, in a way that will not agree with the ideas that may have conceived. It is not at all unlikely or contrary to the ways and works of God to send light to his people in unexpected ways. Would it be right that every avenue should be closed in our school so that the students could not have the benefit of this light? The resolution was not called for. This resolution that if Wagona and Jonas could be allowed to speak in Battle Creek, then the children will not be sent there. This was a resolution that was not called for. You wrote that plans were all laid and that eight Jones and Wagoner and Willie White had things all prepared to make a drive at the general conference. And you warned Elder Butler, a poor sick man, broken in body and in mind, to prepare for the emergency. And in that conference, 
Elder Butler felt called upon to send in telegrams and long letters, stunned by the old landmarks. Just as although the Lord was not present at that conference and would not keep his hand on the work, my testimony was ignored and never in my life experience was I treated as that as at that conference. And I give you, my brother, with some others of a breath and the credit of doing what you could to bring this state of affairs about. You may have thought that you were verily doing God's service, service, but it served the cause of the enemy rather than the cause of God. <laughs> to Elder Olsen, when a new view is presented, the question is often asked, who are it is advocates? What is the position of influence of the one who will teach us who have been students of the Bible for many years? God will send his words of warning by whom he will send. And the question to be settled is not what person is it who brings the message. This does not in any way affect the words spoken by their fruits. You shall know them. To Willie White and White, I have no breaks to put on now. I stand in perfect freedom calling light, light and darkness, darkness. I told them yesterday that the position of the covenants I believed as presented in my volume one, Patriots and Prophets, if that was Dr. Wagner's position, then he had this truth. We hope in God. And so here we have the horns, we have the law in Galatians, and then we have the covenants which we shall be looking into. What did E.G. White talk about the covenants? What did Wagner talk about? And what were these pioneers talking about? Uh, in Someone and Talk, now we want to be a people who carry with us joy and gladness, and we never can do it unless we carry with us Jesus Christ. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. Then I do not need to be mourning all the days of my life, for Christ has risen. He is not in Joseph's new tomb. He is with the Father. And now he, is he there as a lamb slain, and he bears in his hands the marks of the crucifixion. I bear them on the palms of my hands. Oh, if this does not fill us with hope and gratitude, what will? I have the question. I have had the question asked. What do you think of this life that these men are presenting? Why? I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years, the matchless charms of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your minds. When Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly. And they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. Uh, uh, talking about, uh, this is just the three slides and we close. Uh, talking in sermons and talks. She says, I was invited to speak the next Sabbath in the tabernacle, but uh, afterwards, because the impressions were so strong that I had changed, I think the brother felt a little sorry he had asked me. Two elders visited me on the Sabbath morning, and I was asked by one what I was going to speak upon. I said, Brethren, you leave the matter with the Lord and Sister White, for neither the Lord nor Sister White will need to be dictated to by the brethren as to what subject she will bring before them. I am at home in Battle Creek, and on the ground we have broken through the strength of God, and we ask not permission to take the desk in the tabernacle. I take it as my rightful position accorded me of God as a prophetess, as a messenger. But there is a brother, Jonas, who cannot feel as I do, and who will wait an invitation from you. You should do your duty in regard to this matter and open the way before him. So they could not allow <clears throat> this brother to speak because they thought him a nobody. And before they could inspect what he was going to speak, then he would not be given a chance to speak. But it was not so with Sister White because she was holding an office which she was not elected in by men, but by God himself. The elders stated they did not feel free to invite him to speak until they had consulted Brother Smith to know whether he would sanction it, for Elder Smith was older than they. I say, then do this at once, for time is precious, and there is a message to come to these people, and the Lord requires you to open the way for the light to come to the people of God. I say through the word given me of God, <clears throat> those who have stood so firmly to defend their ideas and positions on the law in Galatians have need to search their hearts with us with a lighted candle. 
to see what man of spirit have actuated them. With Paul, I will say, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Galatians 3.1. What satanic persistency and obstinacy has been evidenced? I have had no anxiety about the law in Galatians, but I have had anxiety that our leading brethren should not go over the same ground of resistance to light and the, and the manifest testimonies of the Spirit of God and reject everything to idolize their own supposed ideas and petty theories. I am forced by the attitude my brethren have taken and the Spirit of evidence to say, God deliver me from your ideas of the law in Galatians if the receiving of these ideas will make me so unchristian in my spirit, words and work as many who ought to know better have been. I see not the divine credentials accompanying you. I am warned again and again of what will be the result of this warfare you have persistently maintained against the truth. Again to Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. This was no new light, but it was all light placed where it should be in the third angel's message. What is the burden of that message? John sees a people, he says, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. These people John behold just before he sees the Son of Man having on his hand had a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And this is what was happening in, in 1888. Christ was just about to have uh, on his head a golden crown and uh, uh, in his hand a sharp sickle to harvest the harvest of the earth. Lastly, the first thing recorded in scripture history after the fall was the persecution of Abel. And the last thing in scripture Prophecy in scripture prophecy is the persecution against those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast. We should be the last people on the earth to indulge in the slightest degree the spirit of persecution against those who are bearing the message of God to the world. This is the most terrible feature of an Christ likeness that has manifested itself among us since the Minneapolis meeting. Sometime it will be seen in its truth bearing with all the burden of woe that uh, has resulted. Uh, from it. And uh, this is the ministerial institute, a lead up to the general conference. You tell me how the atmosphere will be right in the general conference session when the ministerial institute, this is the spirit by meeting all things. I want to take us back to the book of Acts, where we are told that we should read and reread the book of Acts because the delineation of events in the book of Acts will repeat themselves just prior to the outpouring of the latter rain. But the most important thing in the book of Acts I want to bring to our attention as I close is the upper room experience, where differences were taken away before people could venture into the field to do a more solemn work of preaching the message that the Pharisees had rejected and the ordinary people accepted. And even the priests who have, were afraid prior to the death of Jesus Christ after his resurrection and the preaching being accompanied by the former reign accepted these messages. But it was after the upper room experience. The ministerial institute was to produce an upper room experience before the general conference session, so as the message is received by the delegates, and then they go to their churches, and the churches get ready for the Blair law, Sunday law that was in the parliament, so that when it is passed, people have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and the work will be done being accompanied by the latter rain and the loud cry, and Christ will come and take his people. But we are still stuck in this session of 1888. We are not bothered about the ministerial institute of having an upper room experience. Then we go in the field or we meet as a general conference to uh, map the work forward so that uh, as delegates, we may go to the churches and be able to spread the truth and make the church members ready for Christ's coming. How I pray that um, these things may resonate with us and uh, we may take the stand with the Lord First of all, seek an upper room experience. Let us not put the doctrines before the upper room experience. 
I'm not saying that we ignore the truth that the Lord has revealed unto us, but I'm saying let these differences about these things first of all be put aside. When the heart is melted with the love of God and people have experienced the reception of Jesus Christ, when the doctrines follow, their hearts will be ready to receive them. So I close with this verse, the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 28 um, and um, verse 9. For whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and are drawn from the breasts. The reason why we are not so successful with the, our general conferences and going with the doctrines that we have is because people have not been weaned from the breast. People have not been fed with Jesus Christ and their hearts melted. We would want to teach knowledge and doctrine to the people who are still on the breast meal. People who are still coming to an understanding of the relationship they may have with Jesus Christ. They are not mature enough to chew the bones and accept the mysteries that sometimes we hold. And instead of inviting them to receive Christ more, we have repulsed them because they have not yet received Jesus Christ. I pray that the things that happen in ministerial institute and general conference may not continue repeating themselves today. And that change starts with me. It starts with you. Bring about the change that you want it to happen. And may the Lord bless us, shall we, and uh, with uh, a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you, because we can look back to the history and get some lessons to guide us in these end times. And these were written for an example for us who have come to the end of the world, Lord. The greatest tragedy of man is not learning from that which has transpired, but the Lord says that he will want from the history, the things that have happened. And so help us today to be opened our eyes and our hearts to be melted unto that which Christ is doing in the most holy place right now. That is... Uh, giving his own righteousness and character to his people. May this moment of visitation not pass us by. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.